like you said, nine different months. You know, we see each other once a month. It's always like, I, I say, he's one of my best friends, but I only see him once a month. Uh, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. And, and for those that have listened to these in the past, um, this is sponsored, co-sponsored by Dental Intelligence and Utah Valley Dental Lab. And um, Dental Intel and Jeremy, you know, as a spokesman and obviously, you know, as, as, as a mascot for this, for, for them, you guys have been great. <clears throat> And, you know, our listeners, a lot of them come from Dental Intel through your you know, marketing to your existing doctor. So, you know, they're saying, yeah, of course I use Dental Intel. And for those that have, haven't used them or looked into them or aren't familiar, I would absolutely look into a Dental Intelligence, Dental Intel. Um, you know, how, how, however I would describe what it actually does for your practice would be an ingestus, <laughs> but it allows you to have information at your fingertips and of what your practice is doing. You know, I look at it every single night on my phone as a dashboard, tells me what I'm doing tomorrow, what my patients that I'm seeing tomorrow, what existing treatment or even insurance that they would still have available. I mean, it, it's just an amazing tool. And some of you have heard this before, but <clears throat> I was, I've been using PracticeWorks as a practice software for almost 28 years. And <laughs> when I looked at what Dental Intel was doing, I said, oh, I've got to have that. And they said, well, we don't really play in the same sandbox as PracticeWorks. I went back home to my staff and I said, I guess what, guys, we're changing our software. <laughs> and man, you could have had a mutiny you know, on my hands. But, you know, we did it successfully and we did it for one primary reason. That was to get dental intel into our practice. And of course, now the women in the office are saying, thank God you did that. And we went with Dentrix because it does play nicely in the sandbox with Dentrix. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really something, again, for those that aren't familiar with it or maybe just kind of looked at it a little bit, look a little deeper because it's... Um, it's really a great program. You guys are growing like crazy. Yeah, we are. It's it's pretty exciting. There's a lot of fun stuff that we're doing. And there's, of course, growing pains that come with that. But uh, at the end of the day, <clears throat> um, it's, it's nice to be a part of a company that is, is striving to grow, but ensuring that really the focus is increasing patient care. Like that's it. At the end, it's that patient experience. So and it's so pretty rad. Pretty cool. Yeah. Well, again, I appreciate for you being involved, being a, one of my best friends yeah. once a month. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and hopefully we'll get to spend a little more time this summer. So thanks again. And Utah Valley Dental Lab, again, as most of you know, um, I've been involved with them for over 20 years. Um, they do all my ceramics. Everything you see tonight is going to be done by Utah Valley. Um, I'm the director of uh, education. And so we do all our courses through them. In our occlusion course, they do all our mountings, all, all our model work and our functional aesthetics. They do all our ceramics as well. And uh, Josh, you and I have been friends for... 20 years. Yeah, long time. Probably. And the nice, nice thing about it is, you know, they've seen these cases go in. You know, when we do our live patient courses, and if you're interested at all, you could go to uvdl.com, go to upcoming events, and you can see when our courses are. We have occlusion courses and live patient functional aesthetic courses where you bring a patient. And the nice thing about it, I mean, Josh, from, from way back in, in the day, you know, you, you being their chair side as we see the case, and you'd be able to say, oh, this is what. This is what these dentists do. <laughs> no, wonder, no wonder my impressions that I get from them suck. Um, you know, be able to see that and, and really understand, you know, how your role as a partner absolutely plays in success. So I want to thank you for that and thank you, Utah Valley. So we're going to actually probably break this into two sections. We're going to focus primarily on aesthetics and the lab communication with aesthetics. But we're going to meet back again July, I mean, June 24th, which is the fourth Thursday. Usually we do the third Thursday, but the fourth Thursday of June. And Josh and I are going to go a little deeper into some other communication skills and techniques we can use, as well as talk a little bit more materials, although we're going to talk about materials tonight. And although I'm kind of running the PowerPoint, Josh, obviously, as we've always done, if you, you know, want to interject or say, hey, David's wrong about this or that, or you want to just say the importance of something, feel free to and you know for me I, I always say that you know I think it's sad that dental school has kind of made dentists think that they should be on this pedestal because we're quote-unquote doctors and and Josh is just a lowly technician and you know I, I send him a prescription and it's like how dare you question me Josh you know I'm, I'm the doctor don't tell me my impression is isn't good or I need this or that or this and I think it's sad that so many dentists feel that way um, I always say it starts as a directive relationship, right? I'm writing a prescription. I send it to Josh. 
And as soon as he gets it, or whoever your technician is, it becomes a consultative relationship where Josh looks at that and says, you know what, I need more information. Or, you know, I'm looking at these photos and David in your temporaries, you know, one side is, you know, we could bring out the buckle quarter, or I think this is angled wrong and or whatever it is, right? It should be that relationship where we're a team. And Josh and I, you know, we, we share our cell phone numbers and I would urge you again, whoever you use, I know all the, the ceramics at Utah Valley, you know, they're, their ceramists have their doctor's cell phone number. So Josh can, you know, text me and say, Hey, you know what? I think maybe we should use a different material or, or I have to do a reduction. Is that a reduction coping? Is that cool? You know, I can answer that in a timely manner. And, and I think it's important to have that relationship. And, you know, Josh, you, you work with a lot of different doctors. You have that relationship and, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, the difference between the doctors that you can have that relationship that you can call them out on stuff versus doctors you've worked with that you haven't? Well, just, it's like night and day. And it's, <clears throat> it's very difficult to do a cosmetic case where a doctor has that type of attitude um, because there's always, there can be issues. Um, I've been doing this for 25 years. Uh, so as far as uh, materials, options like that, to be able to text a doctor say, hey, let's talk, or hey, this is what I'm thinking. I think this is going to work better in this scenario. Uh, it's going to be whether it's a better type of material, stronger, it's going to look better. Um, and to have a doctor then trust me to be like, yeah, I trust that you know what you're doing. And the case, I think, goes better than when it's a doctor that's just like, no, you got to do it this way. So we'll do it that way and see how it goes. It's yeah. just a lot. And it, and it just makes for me personally, my life and my work relationships so much better um, and enjoyable. Yeah, I think so too. And, you know, I think you and I are friends, right? And oh, yeah. I think it's important to have that relationship where, you know, you know your doctor, you know your ceramics versus, a, you know, some big giant lab where you're, you're dealing with, a, you know, an account manager and you don't know who your ceramics is or maybe you not, don't even know their name. You know, I think when you put a face with a personality, with a prep, with whatever, you know, I think it, it certainly adds to that long-term success and the satisfaction when, you know, there's a team there, a true team. Yeah, yeah for sure. And one thing too, I mean, we often, every case is a learning experience. And so if there's something that doesn't go quite right, you'll let me know and vice versa. You know, there's things that we're continually kind of calling each other out saying, eh, yeah, this could have been better. Okay, and, and back and forth. And that's, I think, helped us to progress and do even better restorations. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I appreciate our friendship and our relationship. And you always making my crummy preps look good. <laughs> so, you know, anytime I talk about lab communication, you know, I say basically our goal with lab communication is don't prep and pray. And, you know, some of you may be giggling now saying, oh, yeah, I get it. You know, we've all felt that way, <clears throat> you know, especially early on, maybe in our career where, you prepped, you sent something to the lab and you prayed that whatever came back fit. The occlusion didn't take forever to adjust and the patient liked it, and especially aesthetic cases. And, you know, we talk about during smile design to address the variables. And we're gonna talk about those variables in our lab description tonight. But, you know, I want to provide Josh as a ceramist, because I think I'm, you know, I like to play the role as the architect and he's the builder. I want to provide him a set of blueprints that, I don't really have to pray. You know, he may call me and say, I need to make some changes here or here, or what do you think about this? Um, just like a builder would say that to an architect, hey, you know, let's move you know, the garage door over here for whatever reason. And I think it's important, especially if we're gonna call ourselves cosmetic dentists. You know, probably most of you that are listening and watching tonight, I could go to your practice or I could look at your business card and it would say, general and cosmetic or family and cosmetic, you know, there's some, some aspect of cosmetic dentistry, you know, in your practice. And I think it's, it's our obligation if we're going to practice to dentistry in, to, in today's world, that we need to be smile designers and we need to certainly communicate effectively with our ceramics, with our laboratory, with our patients. Um, so most of you know about me, I, I do have a clinical practice in San Diego. I practice two to three long days a week. Um, after COVID, I came back at two days and I kind of liked it. Um, so I'm working typically 10 hours, two to three days a week. And, and uh, I'm in La Mesa, which is, we don't call them suburbs on the West Coast, but I'm about eight miles 
east of downtown San Diego. And, you know, I tell people I have an adult restorative practice, so I can't ask any, I can't answer any pedo questions for any of you. Um, I say I have two kids in my practice and they both belong to me and they're 22 and 26. So they'd be insulted if I, if I said that they're kids, but you know, as parents, they're always our kids. So um, I do practice so I can totally relate to what you do for a living. Um, that's again, one half of my occupation. You know, I've got to make the same decisions you do is, you know, when you choose the material, when you, you invest in technology. And then the other half of my life is my relationship with Utah Valley. I'm the liaison between Ceramus and Denta. So if Josh had a question about a mounting that he didn't really understand, or a dentist did, had a question about a prep, that's when I get involved in that kind of triad, you know, the, the third leg of the stool in that relationship. And, you know, the one thing for me, it's made me a better dentist because I'm a clinician, but I think like a ceramist. And, you know, I would urge you, yeah, you know, I would recommend if you're not using Utah Valley is, is, to, is to at least give them an opportunity. But whoever you're working with, I would urge you to meet, meet that person. Whether you go to the lab, understand what they're going through, you know, how, how your prep, how your communication may be limiting them versus allowing them or enhancing their ability to provide you a better restoration or better dentistry. Again, Josh and I have been friends a long time. Prior to COVID, I would go up there every two weeks. Um, again, I'm in San Diego. He's in Linden, Utah, which is about 20 miles, 25 miles south of Salt Lake. So we would look at cases together. And, and you know, I'll tell you, I learned so much, Josh, from just saying, man, if I would have prepped it a little different here, or I would have done something different here, you know, it, it would be easier for you. And, you know, I think you can relate to that as, as a ceramist going and seeing what we have to do clinically, you know, in the chair and saying, oh, no wonder that prep looked like that on the just little 15, right? <laughs> Is there anything you want to add here? Feel free to, to jump in. Yeah, for sure. I mean, earlier you had mentioned how going to these courses where we used to travel around the country and go, <clears> and I was a ceramist, and that was so valuable for my training uh, to see basically you as a dentist in action and what you're dealing with and that whole realm and seeing my crowns go in the mouth or veneers helped me to dial in, I guess, my skills and craft uh, so that these are better, um, making it easier on you as a dentist. And that's one of my priorities mm -hmm. that I'm hoping to accomplish. Yeah, and you're doing a great job, doing a great job. Um, I'll show you a couple of cases that we just recently finished. Um, those that follow me on Facebook already saw these. I posted them earlier this week. This is a case we finished last week. Uh, full mouth rehab, a lot of stuff going on here. We use a deep program. We'll call it Freedom Appliance. Um, we can talk about that at another time or if a question comes up. Um, and we're using Lisi. We'll talk about that. Lisi Press from GC. This is 28 units of Lisi. Um, this patient wanted a white smile. This one I actually did in partnership with my associate, Dr. Laura Sosa. Um, lots of times on these big cases, just because of my schedule, I'll do the anterior 20 because we always restore anterior first. And then she went in and she did the molars and she did an amazing, amazing job. And, you know, there's, again, a lot of stuff going on. This guy's a young guy. He's 40 something, good looking guy. Um, and when you just see this quality of ceramics, you know, I wish I could say, you know, I did all this, but all I did was prep it. And then Laura and I sat it. But when I see, uh, especially a cosmetic ceramics, and, you know, I text, I text him right after this and send them a photo. You know, typically cosmetic ceramics, they won't put any anatomy or any, you know, stain on the occlusal. And I looked at these when I, when I took the photograph because Laura cemented these and then I took after photos yesterday, actually, um, or, or Wednesday. What is today? Thursday, yesterday. Um, and I thought, holy cow, man, these look like teeth. And, and I think when ceramics will take the pride, even on back teeth, to do this type of dentistry, I think, you know, this is someone who really cares about what they're doing and they're taking pride in what they do. I mean, these are little pieces of art, you know, and that's, a, you know, another point I wanna make is share this art with your ceramics. You know, Josh, you can totally relate, but you know, it'd be like if I was a jewelry maker and, and I never got to see the stone sat or never got to see it on, on a ring on someone's finger, or I was an artist and never got to see it framed and, and put on the wall. And share this stuff with these ceramics. Because usually what you get, Josh, are stuff that doesn't go, right? Hey, the shade was off. 
look at this, right? Yeah. I mean, it, how, how meaningful in that relationship, again, I'm going to stress the relationship to the ceramics, yeah. to the dentist, how meaningful is that relationship when you can see what you've done? It's, it's huge. And it's a huge learning experience because every case that I do see that's been cemented or bonded, uh, there's things that I'll pick up. I guess I'm my worst critic, um, but it's a learning experience and I'll see, oh man, yeah, I wished I would have changed this little line angle even or changed my effects in my layering a little bit here and there. And so then I take that, hopefully remember, file it away and say, or write me a note that then on the next case, uh, I need to do, I need to change this mm. a little bit. And so, and I'm a visual person. And so seeing images, photos, whatever, help me more than anything else uh, to help just to perfect the craft. Yeah, and, and I think that's important what you brought up is being visual. You know, I think a, a lot of ceram or a lot of clinicians don't realize how visual ceramics are. And I'm very visual. So I think everyone is. And so it's, it's easy for me to transfer that. But, you know, I, I remember not too many, not too long ago, a few months ago, Josh said, hey, can you send me some close-up photos of natural molars? I just want to see what these things look like blown up. And it's like, yeah, I mean, he's never seen that, right? You know, you, you look in your own mouth, or you, maybe you look in one of our courses, but to see it blown up as those previous pictures and you say, so that's what the stain looked like, or that's what the white hypercalcifications look on marginal ridges. And, you know, that's about growth. Um, this is another case we cemented this week. Again, I don't have an in-house ceramics. I wish Josh would move to San Diego. He, he probably wishes he would too. Um, <laughs> every winter. But, yeah, every winter. Um, but this is a okay, case, so everything we do is visual. And we're going to talk about photographs and, and the kind of filters we use. This is a case, single try-in, first try-in, took a lot of photos. This is actually, we, we had done four units of Empress in the early 90s. This is 25 years old. And Empress is discontinued, and we talked about that. So I had to photograph it. She had actually broke, traumatic accident, broke tooth number 10, the crown on 10. So we have to match that. So... He actually used Lisi, Lisi Press, and we'll talk about that. And we tried it in, we went in and bonded it in places immediately after cementation. And, you know, I'm not going to say every case looks like this on immediate trying, especially single central, but we're able to nail this because of the communication, because of quality of photos, because of the information we gave the ceramics. And again, being visual, I, I mean, I could describe this incisal ledge in a million words and still would come back and say, no, that's not what it was at all. By, you know, the saying, a, a photograph is worth 10,000 words. Be, again, ceramics like Josh looks at this visually. And because they're visual, they say, that's what he or she means by that. And so, you, you know, I just posted this case. And, you know, this is the first time you've seen it big like this. Um, but you did an awesome job. made me look good. So <clears throat> Utah Valley Dental Lab, if you're interested at all, and the one unique thing about them is they're a larger lab. They have about 92 people. Um, so they have the ability to afford technology being printers and the best mills. They just bought a new carbon printer and makes, now they have three of them. They have two PM7s, which is the, the top of the mill, in my opinion. Yet they're like master ceramics. Josh, and, Josh is like a master ceramics, little unique lab. He has a waxer and he has someone that he mounts his case. He communicates directly with me, but he has the advantage of working in a lab where you have every technology at your disposal, pretty much. And this is actually a view from the front door of the lab. This is Tipinogus. Um, for those that have been to Sundance, Sundance is on the back side. So I always tell people, if you ever go snow, snowboarding or skiing in Park City or Tipinogus or, um, or, or Sundance or even um, Alta or Snowbird, I mean, it, it's right there. And I would say, take a half day off so you can ride off your trip. Take a half day off and go down the lab and spend some time because it's just amazing to see, especially digital lab. They're very digitally strong. Um, and Josh, I'll let you talk a little bit about this because it's kind of interesting. And I, I spoke at the Indiana State Dental Association meeting on Saturday. And someone said, you know, are they, are they digital designing? Or are they still waxing and pressing? And I said, you know, they're all individual artists, you know, and half the ceramics of the 10 ceramic team, they're doing everything digital. And the other are still just traditionally waxing stuff. And, and when you have the type of printers that we have and the type of mills that, that we have, I say we, Utah Valley, you know, you have the advantage to do that. These are the mills, the PM7. 
And, you know, I'm curious, Josh, because again, you and I worked together for years. Everything was waxed and pressed. And we're going to talk about that in detail. Um, when did, when did you start going the more digital designing route versus waxing? Cause I know you, your design, most all your molars and premolars are digitally designed and you're doing anterior digital design, but then milling it in wax, right. And transferring it. Yeah. Um, I'll do as much as I can digitally. It's just another tool in the tool belt, um, that is fantastic. And it just <clears throat> it better and better as it progresses you know it compounds upon itself um and i've done some just phenomenal restorations that were fully digitally designed milled whether they were zirconia uh emacs um things like that and so i would say you know i've always had an eye on that because it's just it's fun as well and it helps save time and gets things moving faster and cases done uh, so as much as I can, I will do that. Sometimes cases are complex, though, and we have to do it manually um, just to make sure everything's in the proper place uh, for that. But um, more and more has been digitally done, especially, you know, all the molars, premolars, things like that. It, it's fantastic. And yeah. I've always thought, you know, if you're not doing that, you're definitely missing the boat. Um, and, and technology's changed, you know, when you look at, <clears throat> what you know basically ai you know with the libraries and stuff to be able to pull in a molar with all kinds of anatomy and get the occlusion just the way you want it to see that visually and you know i think there's a huge advantage to that <clears throat> and being a digital file right because if you whack something and and you have a mispress or you have something fractured you got to start all over where if it's a digital design i mean you can pull up on the computer and you know you've got that restoration Right there, right there, and so it's ready to go. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So, you know, someone asked me the other day, you know, which is better? It's like hey, there's not a better. I mean, it, it depends on what the technician. You know, we have a couple of ceramists <clears throat> at Utah Valley that all they want to do is wax. They say, no, I don't. I, I, for me, the art form is is taking it and actually fabricating in wax. Where, you know, the art form for the digital designers is you know, the nuances of designing that digitally. You know, I, you know, my son, Phoenix, Phoenix is 26. He's an amazing artist and, and he does a lot of anime type art. I mean, really cool stuff. And he was doing everything with pencil until someone gave him a new pad. And now all of a sudden he's ever doing everything digital, you know, still using, you know, the pen like he did his, his, his colored pencils. But now the, the ability and the flexibility to make changes, you know, on the fly and to save that diagram, you know, it's, it's interesting. And I, I think it's a really a good thing that, that digital and, and again, I'm going to say AI because artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. being able to bring that, that library in and fitting fit to the existing restorations and existing dentistry. I mean, it's, it's magical sometimes how fast that can occur. Um, these are carbon printers. The last time I was up there, they only had two. Now you have three. Um, this is a state-of-the-art printer. It's very, very accurate, down to 25 microns, which is more accurate than a stone model. Um, this is a case where we just did some um, non-prep veneers on almost like a peg lateral. But the amazing thing is that the printer, if you've never seen the way a printer works, it's, it's unbelievable. It actually prints the die separately. And so literally it floats to the top, uh, with this of uh, this this uh, resin liquid resin and you've got the die that's separate and it fits perfectly right down into the the socket that it made and you know it, it was something like if you're waxing on this you know unlike in the past where we can score stone and you can abrade stone and 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 you can change your margins with stone you can't really change it with this i mean the accuracy i think of these models are absolutely incredible uh, which is a different deal than what we had even five years ago you know, the models were our limitation and the inaccuracy of the models. And, you know, there's still some limitations. Let's talk a little bit about this because, you know, I scan, I have the trio. So I scan about, about 80% of my dentistry. And Josh, I'd like your feedback on this is where we did see some problem is on these minimal prep veneers or these large anterior cases, especially when we didn't break contacts. Um, it wasn't so much the accuracy, I think, of the scan, but it was... I guess the model builder is that the software? It, software. It struggled. 
gap. It still hasn't, you know, that'll be the next, one of the next big breakthroughs for the softwares for it to be able to handle um, seeing where that margin is supposed to be. Uh, it gets confused when their veneers and your margins are almost touching. And then they maybe come up over the incisal edge and drop down a little on the lingual. Um, it, it gets really confused um, in trying to read that. So those are where we still would want to do like a traditional. But if you've got a good margin and you've broken contacts, you can go digital and it works almost flawlessly. Yeah. And the nice thing too, I'm going to go back here, but <clears throat> you know, this is all solid model. This is resin. <clears throat> Um, it used to be all my implants, I would always take a traditional impression because I wanted soft tissue models. And now with the carbon printer, they can print the soft tissue and it's actually printed separately and snaps right in there just like a stone model. And so that with the soft tissue and the hard model, I mean, anterior implants are awesome too for this yeah. because of the accuracy, because of the accuracy, you're not misplacing tissue. So you know, this is some of Josh stuff and it, it's, I look at this and they kind of wish I could do that, but I can't, you know, it's cut back and layered. And we'll talk about that. It's just beautiful. And it's, it's so awesome. So let's move on to the lab communication itself. And I tell people I have <clears throat> one goal. So I prep a case or I design a case and prep it, take impressions, whether it be digital or traditional, I sent the lab. My primary goal is to avoid the phone call. Now I say that, and Josh, you know, be, you being the ceramist, you can keep me honest is I say that because I may not be available. And I say that, I say I, but I really mean gen generality of clinicians. We don't answer our phone. So Josh is there, and, and I don't know if you know this the, as clinicians, they're scheduled kind of like we are. I know what I'm doing Tuesday morning when I get back. At 8 a.m. I'm doing this, at 10.30 I'm doing this, at one o'clock I'm doing this. And if, if all of a sudden my patient, my eight o'clock patient decided not to show up till two, I'm kind of screwed. And their schedule is the same way. You know, he looks at his schedule, looks like our schedule and says, you know, in Tuesday morning, I'm waxing David's case, you know, four through 13, or I'm cutting back and I'm layering the porcelain on David's case four through 13. And if he doesn't have all the information, <clears throat> he's sitting waiting, just like we'd be waiting for our patient. And let's say it's an opposing, let's say he had a question about the bite or Maybe he had a question about whether he could do a reduction coping. He just felt that, you know, prep was a little under reduced. He wants to reduce a little bit. <clears throat> so he calls the office. <clears throat> me, he texts me. So even if I'm on a plane, thank God for Delta being able to text on a plane, um, I can answer the text on the plane. The problem is in every ceramist, I know we have a lot of ceramists on the call tonight, <clears throat> is they call the, the office. You as a clinician are not available. And your receptionist or your dental assistant says, I'll leave a sticky note on his desk, his or her desk. <laughs> and Josh is like, waiting. he wants to finish this case, man. That's my eight o'clock patient, right? He's waiting for that phone call. I think you're going to call him right back and you don't call him back. And so Josh calls again in the afternoon and says, hey, you know, if you really want this out tomorrow, because I know you want to see this case, I need the doctor to give me a, a call. I, I, I need an answer here. And so the receptionist says, no problem. I'll put another sticky note on his desk. Two days later, the clinician calls and Josh just says, I can't, you didn't call me back. I can't have it out in time. And you, why don't you add a little bit? Cause I think most clinicians don't realize how big of a problem that is. You want to add to that at all, Josh? Absolutely. Because I love your bullet point of avoid the phone call. Um, because we'll get plenty of lab slips that just say, call me on the lab slip that is not filling out a lab slip and so we get into that from the very beginning of this around and around playing phone tag um and it's it is just like you said it is extremely <laughs> frustrating it puts we're in a production setting and it just kind of moves that case further down the line and and further from getting it done um, and then, you know, if, if, if you have that, say, call me, and it's then a week before we're able to talk, have you forgotten exactly what you were wanting to communicate to me? Um, and then I'm having to take notes. I'm not the best note taker. I might forget something. So it's just, it's, it's a bad situation to, you know, but then there's always things that might happen. And that's where having a cell phone that you can text 
a lot of times they're simple questions that all it requires is a text and you can clarify something and we're good to go within half an hour. Um, and so, yeah, if you're not texting, you should be texting. Um, and that's just the truth of it. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, my avoid the phone call. If I get a phone call, it means I forgot something or I was unclear. And, you know, we've all been in situations of clinicians. You forgot to send a bite. You forgot to send an opposing. It sounds like simplistic and child, but we've all done that. And if they need something to finish the case or they just need some information, you know, we, we didn't provide it. So either answer the phone, change cell phone numbers with your ceramics, or try to avoid that. So let's talk about the aesthetic prescription. And we first came up with this when, when I had PAC Live in San Francisco, which was a live patient course. And we have a lot of doctors on the, the webinar tonight that went through that program. We actually had part of the program, a master ceramics program that was taught by Matt Roberts and Lee Cole. And we had eight or nine labs and Utah Valley was part of it. And literally I had all these master ceramics in a room. And I said, listen guys, I, let's design the prescription. I don't want any more excuses that you didn't get this or doctor didn't transfer this or this or this. And literally I had a flip chart in the front of the room and I just put these things on the flip chart. Okay, you need this. Yeah, we wanna know what the inside is alleged, like what color that translucency is. Okay, let's put that on the lab slip. And now most of the, the big dental lab, the, the, cos, the cosmetic labs, all use a very similar prescription. And Josh will tell you, I don't use a prescription that I check boxes. I write it out in narrative form, which probably drives him crazy because he's used <laughs> to checking a box. Um, but it describes all the variables because you know, if we're doing a cosmetic case and we talk to our patient, we're really talking about variables, right? Shape of teeth, color, polychromacity versus monochromacity, incised ledge translucency, surface texture. You know, these are all variables that I need to transfer to Josh. Otherwise, Josh is either going to do what he likes, which maybe is not what I like or the patient likes, or he's going to call me and I'm not going to answer, right? So we're going to talk about these variables. So this is actually Utah Valley's lab slip. You can write this down. You can take photos. <clears throat> this will be available if you need to review this later. You have some friends that want to, um, to look at this. It'll be available on YouTube. Um, tonight, you do get two hours of CE. If you have friends that want to look at this in the future, you don't get the CE, but they can at least view it. Um, you know, you can obviously change this. You know, as I looked at this, Josh, tonight, we have to make some changes at Utah Valley because some of our materials have changed. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll talk about that. So I want to start first with the type of case. You know, as, as Josh gets a cake in a case, he does waxing for me. He does mountings for me. He does full mouth rehabs. You know, he does single units and he does small designs. I would like the ceramics to kind of have the same mindset as, as I do. You know, we have a huge advantage over the ceramics. We have our patient in the chair. You know, I ask my patients, say, you know, what's your goals? What's your desires? What's your problems? And they share with me, right? And I think that's a huge advantage because from the moment they talk about their problems and desires, my mindset is already moving forward. You know, how am I going to talk to them? You know, what lab, what ceramics, how am I going to communicate the, the, that to the ceramics? And I think if I can send you a case, Josh, and the first thing you do is you say, oh, so this is what this is for. It's a diagnostic case. It's, it's a restorative case. So, you know, I got to start thinking about restoration. I have to go down on the list and and you know, help him determine what materials I want to use. Is a phase treatment? Why did he only prep ten units when obviously it's a full mouth rehab? You know, and, and so you know, I'd like your thoughts on this a little bit. On does this help? If it doesn't, you 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 know, obviously we're going to take this off the lap slip. But as you get a case from me or from anyone, share a little bit with your mindset as you look at this case. Oh yeah, I mean because it. It's, it's gets the case moving in the right direction right away. We know, oh, this is a diagnostic. We're doing a wax up. Um, one thing we would want to add is, are we going to do the diagnostic traditionally waxed or are we going to do it digitally designed and printed? Um, so that changes then my mindset into, well, I don't have to really worry too much about restorative materials at this point. Uh, what are the preps looking like? Those types of things. If it is a restorative case, one of my very first things that I'll do is look for photos. Hopefully they're there so that we know right out of the model room what type of uh, materials we're going to be able to use, whether we have to block out a dark prep, whether there's implants, 
all of those things just from the very beginning help to kind of delegate, I guess, where this case needs to go next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, t I totally agree, especially, you know, I'm, I'm both analog and digital, right? I'll take digital impressions, but I'll still send a face ball and I'll, and I'll still send traditional byte registration bytes, especially if I'm changing vertical. And just you understanding, you know, what my goal is, knowing that, hey, there's bytes somewhere that came in, you know, via snail mail or UPS versus digital. And, and so I agree. I think it's important. Second thing is what's included with the case. And, you know, I think this is important um, because this for me is a packing slip. And I think I can agree, you can agree with me that we've all sent cases and forgot something. Right, Josh, have you ever got a case and there was no opposing or there was no bite? Yeah. yeah. And so you make a phone call, right? And two days later, oh yeah, that's that. That's that little bite that's sitting in the back room that we didn't know what it was or that I threw away, right? Or I've, I've done situations where we forgot to take a stick bite and I got to call the patient back up. So this becomes a packing slip for my dental assistants because I don't obviously pack my own cases. But as I fill this out, they can say, okay, yeah, he's sending me a potion. This is a model. It's a digital scan. Um, the phone, uh-oh, we forgot to take a Facebook. Because if I would have Facebook type Panadent or Stratus, I have a car, and there's not one as my dental assistant is packing that up, she knows that you know it's, it's, it's somewhere in the room or that we forgot to do it. And then this also becomes an unpacking slip for the dental lab. And so what do you talk about like dental lab does, they get the lab slip. As they pull things out, they highlight as if they get an opposing, they're gonna highlight the opposing. So all of a sudden they look around and it says that, you know, we got a stick bite, doctor sent a stick bite, but it is not here. Again, that's a quick phone call before a week and a half later where Josh is now under the gun and he can't get it finished because he never got a stick bite. So I think this is really, really important for this. And, and he, again, you wanna add any of this, Josh? Um, yeah, because it then allows us to know whether we might have misplaced something, possibly get it thrown away, and we have to tell somebody, you've got to go now get in that dumpster and find because <laughs> checked that they sent it, and you, you know, confirmed that it was there, or, you know, there's all of that. So, yeah, exactly, you know, because we're unpacking sometimes 100 cases a day that they're getting through. So we it, being able to track what's in the package from the dentist is very critical from the very beginning. It all starts right there. Yeah, I, I totally agree. This is saved. This has saved my behind numerous times when my dental assistant says, hey, you check diagnostic wax up. We didn't have a diagnostic wax. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. I took it, it's on my desk because I was showing Dr. So to it. <laughs> it's like, sorry about that. Um, because it would just confuse you if you just assumed it was there because I checked it, um, and it and it wasn't there. Um, so stick by, most people know what this is. Again, we're gonna talk about photos. This just tells Josh where the interpupillary line is as we get these cases back, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we're gonna take a photo of that. We'll talk about photos. Um, the photos, we're gonna take our provisionals. You know, again, it's important if I go back to this check check off, you know, right where I'll say photos of another box we need on this lab slip would be photos of provisional. So if there's a discrepancy between the face bone or the face plate, if we're using one that can be parallel to the eyes, and the provisional or the stick bite, if there's a discrepancy, Josh can go back and again, there should be a box here that, that would say photos of provisionals. He can say, well, let's look at the provisional. Because I drop boxes, I like high resolution files versus trying to cut down the resolution and sending them you know, through email. So he can go back and he can look and say, you know, oh, there's the photo of the stick bite. Yeah, David screwed up. It's not parallel to the eyes. I like the provisional better. So we're gonna always do a, a photo of the stick bite. We call this a chin to eyebrow shot. This is just a bender brush with a bite registration, and that should be parallel. I want Josh to see where are the eyes, because sometimes if there's a, a canted posterior maxillary occlusal plane, that model looks funky on the articulator, and it's canted, and then I'm telling you to make it parallel to the tabletop. I want you to be able to say, yeah, David screwed up, or he's right, even though it looks funky on, on an articulator. 
And we see this a lot, Josh, when dentists don't take face posts. And you're not sure, and you've got a candid maxillary occlusal plane in the posterior. And you're not really sure how to mount that where the inside lens should be. And a stick bite sometimes is our only saving yeah. grace, right? So provisionals, again, we do a full smile. And this primarily is so Josh can see, you know, where the smile line is. And, and again, he's artistic, he's visual. He may call me and say, you know, what do you think about length of the centrals a little bit? Do you think it'll look a little nicer? And, you know, I can go back to this same photo and say, you know what? Yeah, let's lengthen a little. And have the patient in and see if she could tolerate it. Or he may say, you know, look at the buccal quarter. I think that the right is out a little too far. Is there if I tuck it in? It's like, oh yeah, I kind of screwed up. Or no, I like the way it is. Or let's bring out the other side to match this. Again, this just gives basically a visual artistic side to that stone model of provisionals that I'm going to send it. And then we do a chin to eyebrow provisionals. And this is showing Josh basically where the midline is. Is there a cant? Because I typically take these five days later in my practice, five to seven days when the patient's not numb. And, you know, let's say there's a tiny bit of a cant. The patient says, oh, I love my new smile. It's perfect. But I see a little bit of a cant. You know, instead of having to remake all my temporaries, you know, I can just take this photo and say, hey, Josh, notice in the provisional chin to eyebrow, Notice there's a slight cant to the left. Make sure you correct that in the final restoration. And that's an easy fix for you, right, Josh? Yeah, absolutely. If you can see it, and he sees the models, and he can say, oh, I see what David did. Yep, we need to upright that a little bit. So we always take this chin to eyebrow of provisional skin that tells us where our inside ledge, tells us where our midline is. So our necessary photos, and this would be typically for me, would be when I have a, a wax up done for a smile design case. And Josh, tell me if, if there's anything else you need. You know, we always do the preoperative and we do the 12 AACD views, the American Academy, Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry view, and you can go on their website. And then we add profile. So we do full face. I like vertical because I think it looks better, especially if you're gonna put on Instagram, Facebook, or your website. If you're thinking about ever becoming accredited, for the AACD, you need to take a horizontal as well, but always take a vertical. Um, this is just a blue background. I have just, a, um, I went to a, an art store and just found a, um, a canvas and took a basically a white, a gray and a blue um, spray paint and just kind of sprayed it so we get kind of a neutral background. So we're gonna take full face and, you know, I like this for you, Josh, so you can see who my patient is. Absolutely. Right. It's like you, you put a personality. I mean, this is Jeff. He's out of Chicago and, and you, you know, Jeff. And, you know, we can look at this and say, you know, so this is whose smile I'm fixing and, and I can potentially change his life. And I, I just think that's really powerful because I've seen you when I've walked into your, in your little, I'm not going to say operatory, your little studio where you design and you've got the, the full face photo on the screen as you're still doing ceramics. Right. I mean, it's like, that's your, that's your patient too. Yeah. Right. So we're going to do full face. We're going to do both retracted. These are one to two views or two to one views, um, both retracted and a left and right and a full facial smile. Again, I do this for my own before and afters, uh, but also so Josh has these because I'm going to send him the before and after and then he can see, you know, what am I dealing with here? We're also going to do occlusal views and one to one shots. And the way we, we get that black background on the one to ones, the close ups is there's something called a contraster, which you can get from Photomed or Lester Dine. Um, it's just a black plastic and it just kind of just highlights that inside ledges and the shapes. Again, these are nice shots, especially when you do before and afters and you have jacked up teeth and you really get to see a close up of the incisal. And this is the profile. And this is not part of the ACD's views, but this is really, really powerful because it shows Josh basically whether this is a deflective or a reflective surface. And lots of times I'll tell Josh in my prescription, bring out the incisal facial edge of the central one and a half millimeters, and then bring everything else to, to match that arch. And Josh can look at it and say, oh yeah, because the model, the stone model, you can't tell, mm -hmm. right? But now he can look at this profile shot and say, well, that's why David wants me to upright that. And so I, I, this is one of my favorite shots, actually, Josh and I, and I would say probably where I've, I'm not gonna say screwed up, I hate to use that word, but where I've made changes from my provisionals 
to where I want to go with my finals. And I'm sure you'd agree with me on this because you've got notes from me. Um, when I would say, look at profile of provisionals, bring out the facial and sizal edge, a millimeter and a half, and then make the two normal shape. Um, but I want you to be able to see that. I mean, does this help you? Oh, it's so helpful. Photos are hand in hand with just filling out the lab slip, you know, with a pen and a pencil. Uh, photos are right there, absolutely necessary. Um, I've had cases that just didn't get photos, told to go for it, went for it, case didn't go, patient didn't like it, uh, finally got photos, not under, not seeing, because the case looked fine. We, it was hard trying to figure out why, and then finally get the photos, and it's just like a light bulb turns on going, oh yeah, I see exactly what's wrong here. And we made changes and redid the case and went great. Yeah. All because of photos, especially full face photos. So we can see not just the personality, but just see how their teeth fit into their face. If they're too small, if they're too big, do they you know, look right? Yeah. And th this is, again, the profile shot I like too, because sometimes there may be an under preparation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and and you think God, it would be really nice if I could bring these out, right? But you don't know because yeah. you, you can't really see it. You can go back to this profile shot, especially at provisionals, and say, you know what? Let me call David because I think if we upright it, it's going to look better, and it gives me a little bit more room, a little bit more freedom in that envelope of function in the interior. So, good, 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 good. All right, goal of the final case. This would be next in our prescription. Uh, what's our goal again, Josh? you know, knows what kind of case it is. It's a restorative case. He's seen all the photos, meets my patient as much as he can, 15, 1,500 miles away. Now, what's the goal of the case? You know, I've had cases where patient had a diastema and we kept it, right? And if I wouldn't, if I would have said something, you would have just closed my diastema. Some of these cases, the primary goal of our patient is to close the diastema. You know, if you got to make whiter teeth than we would like. So, you know, and, and there's going to be multiple checks in this, right? Um, it's really important if you're going to restore this in a CR, what we call a physiological bite, you know, to make sure that Josh has the right bites for that. Um, is, it, is there anything you want to add to this? You know, every time I look at this, I think, shoot, we need to add this, we need to add that. Just fill it out, you know. <laughs> Uh, CR, we're restoring to CR, not CO, um, okay. because we'll often get multiple bites, bites in CO, bites in CR, and it's a toss up. But then, oh, yeah, look right here, it says, yep. So I can tell my model room people, no, use these bites. This is what we're going to go with, and we're good to go. Yeah. This is really important in a wax up, because if there's missing a tooth and I didn't really want you to replace that yet. And all of a sudden you wax it all up and give me all my matrices when you wax that pond. It's like, wait a minute, there's an implant there. I'm not ready for that yet. Yeah. <laughs> so give that, you know, you can't really give them, well, I'm not going to say that. I was going to say, you can't give them too much information. You can if it's conflicting. Yeah. And we'll talk a bit about that with impressions. Um, type of res restoration desired, and we do need to change this. So again, I like Josh, he looks at this and <clears throat> he looks at my props, he looks at my bite. And he's thinking there's not enough clearance for Empress or Emacs. <clears throat> and then he looks and says, oh, David wants zirconia on this. So that's fine. No problem. Right. Or the prep is dark. So again, I'm going to call out the restoration. You know, as you start your relationship with your ceramics, I would urge you to have more of a communication with them. Say, hey, Josh, I sent you this case. You saw the preps. You saw the, the, the color of the prep. What do you think would be the best material for this? And, and work as a team. Um, so I like to tell them what I'm doing. Sometimes it's, if it's a bridge, it's going to be zirconia reinforced, but maybe the veneers around that are going to be pressed ceramic. So we're going to change this a little bit. Empress, unfortunately, we'll talk a little bit of how this is made. This is my favorite material of all time. Um, I have a Clara and all their wisdom decided they were going to discontinue it. So it is discontinued. We have, a found, we have found a material that we like really, really well. Uh, we'll show you some. In fact, the cases you saw earlier when I said these are the cases I sat this week is Lisi Press from DC. So um, we're doing Emacs. 
We're doing leasing press in the press ceramic world for us. Um, we'll talk a little bit about advantages and disadvantages. Milled ceramic, again, Empress is out. Unfortunately, we could not mill Lisi. So we have to mill Emacs or Zirconia. So Spathid, we don't really do much anymore um, with the advantages of the ceramics that we have with pressed or milled. Um, sometimes we'll you do a felt spathic or a powder liquid when we have a tetracycline banded case, um, but very, very rare. And then obviously zirconia, whether it be supported, again, we need to change this because the new monolithic HT zirconia, we'll talk about it, are beautiful. And that's kind of become my restoration of choice for a single molar crown would be an HT zirconia. We'll talk about those. And Josh is doing an amazing job with that. So let's talk a bit about materials. And Josh, anytime just like throw in or Kent, Kent uh, Coli, who is the director of operations at Utah Valley is monitoring your questions. So if you have any questions about this and it's it's apropos at the time, he'll interrupt me and, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure we address that both from the lab side and the clinician side. So, you know, this is obviously subjective, but for what Utah Valley Dental Lab and what I use in my own practice, Lisi Press, um, is 100% of my anterior cases now if, if a bridge is not involved. It's a material that um, is a lithium disilicate, so it's got the strength of Emacs, but I think it's honestly, and I hate to say this, it's prettier than Emacs. Would you agree with me, Josh, on that? Yeah, for sure. It looks like Empress. It doesn't gray out, and, and a lot of you, if you've done a lot of Emacs, you can totally relate to the few cases that have come through where everything is perfect except it just... It just has a little bit, I always say it's a bright C1 instead of a bright B1. Um, it just has a little bit of a grayness to it. Um, so Lisi Press has been on the market for about three or four years. Very cool material. We'll talk about how we fabricate that. We're still doing a lot of Emacs, um, primarily because it's been on the market 15 years. It's an excellent material. The aesthetics are really good. Um, I just don't care for it as much in the anterior. Most of our molars, because we can mill this, and we'll talk about it. So Josh and I may do a case where um, I'll do Lisi Press in the anterior, and then the molars. I always say I want Lisi Press, and he says, "Hey, can I do Emacs because I can do it digitally?" And I'll say, "Yeah, no problem," because in the posterior, it's going to match, and it's going to blend in, and and we can bond to it, and we know all about it. And then the zirconia, and zirconia, you know, ten years ago, Josh, I did zero with you. Five years ago, I did 3% with you, and now it's 100% of my single posteriors um, with the HT, and we'll talk about that. That's full contour. Um, I mean, literally, you agree with me, probably. You could take an Emax, and you could take one of the new high translucent zirconia, same file, so you mill them, exact same restoration, and they both look equally as good as that. Yeah. You agree with me on that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and we know we can bond to it. We talked about that, um, a webinar that we did in the fall on cementation. Um, and it's just become a cool material and then core supported as a bridge for previously when I showed you those pucks where we milled an all on four and all on X. And Kent is our resident expert on all on Xs um, who's answering our questions. If you have any questions on an all on four or five, we call them all on Xs because it could be six or 10. Um, if you have any questions on that, be sure to call the lab and, and talk to Kent. So these would be the three primary materials. We're going to talk about how they're made. And it's, you know, this is going to be a review for a lot of you. But I tell you, a lot of younger dentists honestly don't know. And we got a lot of young dentists here on the, the webinar tonight. A lot of you don't really know how these things are made. And I think it's kind of important as you think about what the ceramics going through. So the first is the press. And that would be Lisi Pressed or Emacs where they use a lost wax technique, where they actually wax the full contour. And this could be traditional wax. You know, they've got their stone model or their printed resin model. They are gonna wax, check in the occlusion, then they're gonna sprue it, they're gonna invest it. And these are some onlays that, that Josh did for me. Or it could be milled. And I want you to talk a little bit about this, Josh. So Josh can still use a material like Lisi Press, which we don't have a, we don't have an ink, we don't have a block for it. We can't mill it. But he likes the idea of using a digital design. So he can still design it digitally, whether it be anterior or posterior, there's a couple cantilevers even. 
where you can send it to, to the mill and this is the PM7 mills is out of wax. So instead of you know the labor intensive of adding wax, adding and subtracting, adding and subtracting, he can mill it and then he can then he can alter it. You can add to it, you can do your margins. You want to talk a little bit about how this technology has changed is the it's way you do some of your stuff? Yeah. Um, I've done a number of cases where we've designed digitally, milled in wax. You get, you can see where the wax pattern is still connected to the puck. So that'll get cut off, but it leaves a little sprue uh, on there that I can, all I need to do is take like a knife, Bard Parker or something, my carver, smooth that off, takes a couple minutes, and these will seat perfectly to the die. And I've done a number of cases where I've put them on the dies, haven't had to touch a single thing. Contacts are perfect, length is dialed in, contours are beautiful, and margins are right there. Like they, I didn't have to touch them, put them right to the press, finish the case, and it's done. I did it, I've done a number of those for you, David, um, that I love them. It's, it's so nice, um, easy to work with. So yeah, that, uh, it definitely does better when they're full coverage, like you see most of these are. Veneers, it, it does okay, but you probably, because veneers can get thin, uh, they might chip a little bit. So there is some repair work that might need to be done with your waxer. Uh, but for the most part, it's pretty cool. Yeah, the nice thing too I like about this is, Josh and I have done a lot of cases where we may have a really, really dark prep as part of the case. So let's say tooth number nine, endodontically treated, or it could be an implant that maybe it's a metal coping or maybe it's a bright white abutment. And the rest of the case is pretty normal. You know, this is kind of cool in that literally you can say, okay, you know, I'm gonna charge a little bit more. What I'm gonna do is that single dark tooth, I'm going to press it or mill it out of a different, a different ingot, a different opacity ceramic. And since, because it's a digital file, he can, he can make me two of the exact same crown and I have to re-wax it. And, you know, sometimes I get this back and it's like, God, thank God he did this second unit because that's what went in. The first one where we thought was going to work, it, there's no way that would have worked. So again, digital files is huge. And, you know, that's why I tell doctors, I say the, the beauty of digital is that it, it's a file. I mean, we don't have to start all over. If I need a new crown, you you know, you can just wax it, you know, you can mill it and, and press it or mill it and mill it, right? So yeah, this is this is cool. And Josh does a lot of these. Some of the ceramics do not. They like to hand wax everything and, and you know, all the power to them. But I think this is a huge, huge advantage. So what they do is with press, and the reason why it's called press, because the ceramic is literally pneumatically pressed, they will go ahead and take out, take that wax pattern, they will sprue it. They will then put the sprue on top of this gray cylinder here. They will then put this nylon cylinder over the gray. They will then take an investment and they will mix it with water and pour it into that sleeve. And here it is, they're pouring into that nylon sleeve. Once it's set up, they will take off the sleeve. They will then take the ceramic. So you have the investment. That's what was in that, that nylon sleeve. You then have the ceramic ingot, and whether this be Lisi, Empress, or Emax, it's available, available on all the Vita shades, about 31 different opacity translucency. So this is two single crowns. Instead of a, a narrow little sprue, it's kind of a fan-shaped sprue. So this would be actually the sprue. This would be our crown. That's what your prep looked like. This is after the wax has been burned out. So after the investment sets up, they stick it in the ceramic furnace. They burn out the wax pattern. And so you have, I'm gonna go back, you have two crowns here, and this again is the sprue. This is our ceramic ingot. And then these two are actually plungers, ceramic plungers. And what they do is they heat it to a honey-like consistency, the ceramic, and they actually pneumatically press, and that's why it's called pressed ceramic, those plungers into that molten ceramic. So these are Empress and Emax presses, Lisi, Lisi presses. Um, we have eight at Utah Valley. Normally you would see kind of a cover over these. You may look at them and say, what is this robotic looking thing? Normally there's a, a white plastic cover, but it's just for cosmetics. So that press is actually pressing 
that molten ceramic into that burned out tooth mold, hence pressed ceramic. And then they let that cool. So this is what it would look like as it's sectioned in half. Again, this would be our sprue. This would be our two crowns. They will then divest it. They will break out that investment. You can see here's two, two full coverage crowns. They'll take a sandblaster and they'll divest it. And this is where it becomes, you know, very technique sensitive because, you know, I mean, Josh, you've seen this where you, you've gone to this stage and you go to divest it and all of a sudden your thin empress margin is gone now because it was, too, you know, too much abrasive, too, too, too aggressive in the divesting. They'll clean it up. Then they'll cut off the sprue. Again, this could be Lisi or Empress. Again, Empress would have been my favorite. If I had to redo my veneers today, I would say, how much Empress do you have left? But if not, I would go Lisi. Unfortunately, it's discontinued. This would be a molar, again, wax to full contour. This could be wax or it could be digitally waxed. Then they'll take, this is what the Emax ingot looks like. There's two different sizes because you can do bridges with Emax. And this is what the crown would look like after divesting. You can see the remnant of the sprue. Again, Lisi ingots, um, they just have the small ones. Um, it's available in, in multiple shades as well. And a lot of labs have gotten to, to start using Lisi primarily because Empress is discontinued. And, and we're looking for another tool in our tool belt for aesthetic white anterior dentistry. So again, these are the onlines I showed you initially. The sprues will be cut off. They'll be fit back to the master dies, and then they'll be made to look like teeth. This is an anterior case, veneers and crowns. You can see four sprues. We'll put that nylon cylinder. We'll put the investment over it. Again, these happen to be Emacs. Break out the, the investment, divest, cut off the sprues, make them look like a tooth. Again, crown, you can see the remnant of the sprue. That's going to be cut off, polished, made look like a tooth. So that's the lost wax. So as you talk to your ceramist, you may say, hey, I want you to use a lost wax. And, or the ceramist may say, you know, I use a lost wax. The second technique is milled. And it used to be if, if I said, hey, I'm milling my Emacs, that meant I had a Cerec machine or a plan scan machine. Labs did not mill because you can only mill in a Cerec unit one block at a time, which was not efficient. Now with the new mills, and I showed you the PM7, I mean, you can mill up to 48 restorations at a time. So this could be either in office or in laboratory. And for us in this technique, it would be Emacs or Zirconia. So what they do is Emacs, they take this, what they call a blue block. This is Emacs CAD. You can see it's kind of periwinkle purple, but it's A1. This is pre-crystalline Emacs, it's softer, so it's easier to mill. That's what they will mill. So they design it on the design software. I showed you how we do that. We use three shape. We send it to the mill. The mill will then mill this in the blue block state. So it comes out as a purple tooth. This could be anterior or posterior. And then you stick it in the ceramic furnace, depending on the firing cycle, 12 to 22 minutes. And that purple tooth becomes A1. And that's milled. And if Josh said, hey, I'm going to mill these, I'd say that's fine. Why? Because we have the same goal. You want to make sure it fits. You want to make sure it looks good. And it's a good restoration rotation. If you said, you know, I'm going to wax this case, I'm not even going to question your judgment. It's, you know, it's, I may ask why. <laughs> sometimes it's an undercut. Maybe there's a little bit of an undercut. Sometimes it's easier to deal with traditional waxing. But um, I know for you and I, you're milling most of your posteriors. Uh, pretty much everything. Even yeah. on lays, inlays, we can mill. Um, yeah. And so accurate. Yeah, and it used to be we couldn't do that. We'd only mill full coverage crowns because the mills were not very accurate. And for those that are CEREC docs or plan scan docs, you know, that's a three axis mill with, we call them tools, but two diamond burrs where the PM7, the mill I showed you earlier, it's a seven axis mill and it has 16 different tools. So the accuracy and the ability to, to mill thin margins and tertiary anatomy is absolutely incredible. So these are the mills. Um, if you look here on the screen, those are can either be pucks. Those are that are white there out of the out of the eight. Those are pucks, which would be zirconia. But the Emacs is not available in the puck, like the wax or the zirconia. So what Ivaclar did is created these cassettes, and these cassettes will hold up to six different blocks. And these can be all different shades. These are all the same. They can all be different shades. They go into the PM7, and I, I love technology and automation. 
But to see this machine, just go pick that one block out, move it over, go through these series of, of diamond burrs of tools, um, first doing the gross grinding and then finally doing the fine with a very fine diamond, going, putting that back and grabbing the next block. I mean, it just amazes me. And, you know, the accuracy of these, as Josh said, I mean, we can do inlays, we can do onlays. That inlay I did on, did you mill that one? The one I did on Wednesday, I think that, yeah, yeah you did that, you milled it. Yeah. Used to be those never fit if we milled them, right? right? Certainly not with a bunch of anatomy. Uh, but the fit is absolutely amazing against the accuracy of the mill. And again, this is what they call blue block. And then they would put it in a centering furnace or crystallization furnace and it becomes A1. So that's milled. And, it, you know, people always say, which is stronger? Well, if you really look at the fine details of the data, the wax and press is a tiny bit stronger in, in, in flexural strength, but it's, in my opinion, it's clinically in, insignificant. It's like 390 to 410. Versus and so it is really not much difference at all. Um, as I said, lisi cannot be milled. We we don't have blocks yet. It has to be wax and press. So let's talk a bit about zirconia, the fastest restoration in the in the history of modern dentistry. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Over seventy percent of restorations out of U.S. labs are partly zirconia. I say zirconia partly meaning it's either a framework for a bridge or it's a monolithic, 70%. And this is a restoration that's only 11 years old. So we have traditional zirconia, and that was the Bruxer, if you remember when the Bruxer first came out, or lava as a coping. And the Bruxer came out in 2010. So we've had the availability to do monolithic for 11 years. And that was traditional. It was very opaque, very bright white. And I know a lot of you can relate to me in saying, yeah, we'd maybe use it on second molars, but it was ugly. That's the only time we'd ever use it. And then about seven or eight years ago, uh, manufacturers came out with what they call the high translucency zirconia HT. And in Indiana this weekend, Josh, I, I said, how many people have been using HT? And maybe out of the 70 people in the audience, maybe 10 people raised in their hand and the other people didn't. And I said, well, how many of you noticed that the zirconia that you've gotten back from your lab in the last couple of years looks better than it used to? And they all raised their hand. It's, yeah, that's because it was HT. And that's HT zirconia. And, the difference is the original Bruxer or what we need to use for framework for long, long span bridges or the all on four is what we call tetragonal, which means the crystals are all tetragons. And the advantage of tetragonal is it's very, very high strength. And we'll go over the strength num numbers compared to other ceramic. The problem is it's opaque. And again, I think you can all relate to me. And I remember when the Bruxer first came out and I called Jim Glidewell and I said, send me some. And it was like, dude, this is, I mean, it looks like a big, hard, shiny temporary to me. I mean, it was ugly and it was not going to replace anything that I was doing at the time. And then manufacturers said, you know, there is other zirconia in our world. It's called cubic. And, you know, we've seen cubic zirconia stones. It looks like diamonds. It's perfectly clear. And so what manufacturers literally did they took a little baggie of tetragonal crystals. They took a little bit of cubic. They mixed them together in different ratios to make zirconia translucent. So cubic, typically in the zirconium dioxide, is rel has relatively low strength, but it's completely clear. So manufacturers can put a little bit of this magic dust of the two together, and they can alter strengths as well as translucency. So again, if we're doing a multi-unit bridge or you know, six unit bridge, Josh, which we did. I sat at Monday. We had to get tetragonal. We needed the strength, but then he layered all this cool on top of uh, cool stuff on top of it to make it look like a tooth, right? Where single crowns in the posterior or three unit bridges in the anterior, we just use the HT because it's strong enough and it's it's beautiful. Um, so we kind of pick and choose based on what our goal is. So all zirconia, if you've never seen it, this is called what we call a pox, some people call it a disc. It's 100 millimeters in diameter, 14 to 22 millimeters thick. And they all start out white. This is pre-centered zirconia, what they call it, zirconia in its green state. This could be A4, this could be B00. We have no idea until we actually center it. So again, multi-unit bridges behind there, that's a centering furnace, um, different brands on the market. They will mill it. Again, we use a five axis and a seven axis mill. Very, very accurate. I mean, when I first 
saw this and I first saw this almost eight years ago at Utah Valley when we when we were at the old lab and I thought holy cow I mean look at the look at the anatomy on these things this is a different deal than what I had seen with zirconia or, or any of the serac restorations that I had seen at the time very very accurate now as I mentioned zirconia being the fastest growing restoration in dentistry why why has it grown so much why is 70 percent of dentistry that we do clinicians and what laboratories send out most laboratories utah valley isn't unique in that it's primarily aesthetic um why did it become so popular it has to do with flexural strength so when they evaluate flexural strength when ceramic engineers or manufacturers do this what they do is literally they take two sawhorses they put a bar of ceramic over the sawhorses they apply a force until it breaks and then when that breaks, they get an LED reading of what, how much force did it take to break that ceramic? And, you know, if we look at this, we think, you know what, this, the more force it took, probably the more durable the ceramic is. That's the marginal ridge. That's our central fossa, which is a huge advantage to someone like Josh, because if I under prepped and I want, I don't want gold and I don't want a PFM with a metal occlusal, you can say, you know what, I can actually do zirconia because it's stronger than the other materials we have. And I know that's changed the way you look at some of your communication with your with your docs, Josh. Right. Yes. So if we look at the strength and, cut and chime in anytime, yes. if we look at the flexural strength of the different materials, powder liquid ceramic felt spathy has a flexural strength of 100 megapascals. And that's why most of the people that do powder liquid ceramic, they would say, try to keep all your preparation in enamel because they don't want that tooth to flex. Emacs or Empress, when it came out in 1994, we were all excited because it was twice as strong as a PFM, 200 megapascal, which means my marginal ridge was twice as strong as the, the powder liquid that was on every PFM I had ever done. And when Emacs came out in, it's been 15 years, 2006, it flexural strength was 400. And that's why Emacs kind of took over the industry because now all of a sudden we could have it a little bit thinner, a little bit more durable. We could even traditionally cement it. And I know Josh, for, for you all, some of the doctors were saying, send me Emax, send me Emax, um, because of strength issues, right? And, and it's easier for you guys to work with than Empress. Uh, I mean, it's harder to grind on. Um, it was always nice to do Empress because it was soft and you could, you know, really grind fast. And Emax is a little different. You had to make sure your burrs were new and fresh so that you didn't spend the whole time grinding. But hopefully a lot of that was worked out in your waxing or milling. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And then the zirconia, we have 550 to 1500, depending on how much cubic. So if Josh has a lot of clearance on a retentive prep and he can choose a zirconia that is still stronger than Emacs, but it's really translucent. If he's doing a multi-unit bridge, like the one he sent me this week, he's got to say, you know what, I got to pick something that's a little stronger for the six-unit bridge. And so very, very interesting. And again, Utah Valley uses different zirconia. Um, there's a lot of different manufacturers. Some people say, why don't you just use one? A lot of it has to do with shade. And I know, Josh, you and I have had this communication where I'll pick a certain shade. I like lava aesthetic. I'll say, make it out of lava aesthetic. And you'll say, their A2 doesn't match the A2. Not that shade. <laughs> yeah. And so that's a lot of times they'll do this. But, um, you know, this is an example. A couple times ago, a couple months ago, when I was at Utah Valley, I just grabbed some and took some photos. So you look at like Katana, which is Nortaki zirconia. I like it. It's a good looking uh, zirconia. The ML is, is tetragonal. So Josh may pick that for a six unit bridge or a 10 unit bridge or an all on X has a high flexural strength. So I would only use it on bridge frameworks or all in exit. UTML is very, very translucent, but it's weak. So he's never gonna do a bridge out of this. So this would be enter a brown, enter a bridge in single crowns. Lava aesthetic is at 850, enter a bridge in single crown. So again, the conversation may be from your ceramics, hey, you know what, I'm gonna pick a different material based on shade or thickness or strength. Again, trust your ceramics because your ceramics, they have the same goal you do, right? You don't want to get a broken restoration back, Josh. No. And I don't want that either. I don't want that yeah. either. So this is a case we did years ago when they first came out with the HT. And, and I just want to kind of show you, 
you know, how this can look in the mouth because my goal at the time was to find something that was replacing Emacs on a second molar. And for those that have done enough Emacs, you've had a, you've had Emacs break, especially on second molars, especially with low clearance. And Josh, I know you've gotten some of those back probably from me, right? Um, and so traditional zirconia was really not the answer. I mean, it was too opaque. So Lava said it could just come out. So this is actually a ceramist and he, you know, strong masseters breaking everything. So we decided to do these three monolithic units. Now you see the molar, that's tetragonal, that's ML. So you can see it's opaque, it doesn't, it's opaque. It doesn't look like a two, but the two premolars are both HT. And these are monolithic, these are not cut back. They're just superficially stained. Now it's not real evident here. Again, this is the monolithic. You can see that it's more opaque and more bright. There's the lava aesthetic. You take it to the mouth and yeah, the molar's ugly, but the premolars start to look like tea. And so, you know, this was kind of a magic moment. This is a case that you did for me, Josh, where it's like, okay, I kind of get it, right? This now gives me another tool in my tool belt where I can use, where before these would have absolutely been Emacs or Emperors. Yeah. And now I can use a material that's twice as strong as Emacs and it looks like Emacs and it fits like Emacs and I can bond to it. We know we can bond to zirconia. Um, so these HT, if you haven't tried them, we haven't talked to your ceramist about it, talk to them about it. Um, there is a material that we're real excited about at Utah Valley and you might've seen the ads and I'd like your input on this, Josh. Okay. It's called Zircad Prime and it's Ivaclar's new entry and they did something really unusual. So this is a puck and I just told you 14 to 22 millimeters thick. Almost every manufacturer, the Katana, La Aesthetic, um, Ivaclar has another zirconium, and the list goes on and on. They've created a way to alter translucencies within the restoration. So literally as Josh designed this, imagine if this, this central was 12 millimeters tall and we had a 22 millimeter puck, Josh can literally move that central up and down that puck to maximize how much translucent. So we have a body shade, we have a transition and an enamel shade. Even though we have different translucency, it's all the same strength. So if you want to do a bridge out of this, yeah, he could move it up toward the surface, but it's, it's still all the same strength from the incisal head to the gingival third. What Ivan Clark did is they created a multi-layer puck with this Zircad Prime and they were able to change the translucency, but also the strength. So some of the manufacturers, you may have seen this for the listeners, where they describe instead of like an HT or ultra translucent, they'll say it's 5Y or 3Y. And that's the yttrium concentration. And the lower the yttrium, the more tetragonal, which means it's stronger. So if someone says, yeah, I use a 3Y, it means that was opaque and very, very strong. If someone said they use a 5Y, very translucent, but you call for my strength. So what Iva Clark did is they were able to design this such that you, Josh could literally move this, this design, the Sephora a bridge within that puck to maximize aesthetics, but maximize strength in the connector. Yeah. So this is just superficially stained. You can see as we backlight this, we have inherent translucency in almost the incisal one half or the, certainly the one third, yet we have a tetragonal at all the connector. And this is kind of interesting bridge. I want to show this and I want your feedback on, on this because we've done, was that bridge you sent me this week? Was that Zircad? Yeah. Right, okay. So when we first got it, I thought, yeah, you know, I have a again, it's another marketing ploy, whatever. And this was a bridge that, that Ed, who's the digital designer for a lot of this, is he designed it out of Katana and I like Katana. So I'm looking at this thing, this is cool. And then I'm looking at the, the new box of Zircad Prime that just came in. And I said, will you do me a favor? Will you just mill one out of Zircad Prime? You know, same file, no changes. I just want to see what it looks compared to Katana, which was my favorite at the time. So this is the two materials, same file. The one on the left is, this is right out of the mill. You can see how rough this is. That is Zircad Prime. Look how much translucency is in that. Yet the connectors, the strength of that whole gingival half is stronger, almost twice as strong of the Zircad Prime than the one on the right, which is Katana. Yep, look how much translucency. So Josh, when you get something like this, do you think, 
Holy cow, I don't even have to cut back and layer. <laughs> All I have to do is like superficially stain it and paint the gums pink. Uh, what's your been your experience with with Zircad Prime? I love it. It's what I that it's my go-to zirconia. Um, now is is that even in the posterior, you know, we can move that to where we have maximized strength, but still pick up a little, you know, translucency, a little of that on the occlusion, uh, so that it's looking a little bit better. Um, and then in the anterior, I did another bridge for another doctor, seven through ten, implant supported, that <clears throat> couldn't cut back. Did Zercad Prime in a, I think it was a B1, and looked phenomenal. I mean, it looked, it had translucency, and it really, really looked good. So. Yeah, it's interesting material. Um, a, a lot of dentists have not heard of this. Again, I, you know, when I'm in Zoom webinars like this, I always say, how many people have tried this? But I don't even know if anyone's even paying attention. You know, they're in the other room watching a baseball game or something. Um, mm -hmm. Or at the pool or playing with their kids or yeah. playing pool or whatever. Um, David, can I interrupt for just yeah, a Yeah, absolutely. Time? Um, so there have been a couple of different questions, uh, but both surrounding the same topic. And I apologize if you're going to address this in the upcoming slide. But with respect to uh, cases where you may have only one or two teeth in an arch that you're restoring, um, how do you address blocking out discoloration uh, on a case where maybe you have a couple of molars or a bicuspid that has discoloration. And then in the anterior, you may have a minim minimal prep or no prep, prepless case. I know you, you kind of talked about that earlier in one technique with a coping, but yeah. I'm not sure that everybody understood. Okay, so let's talk a bit about that. Josh and I have done lots of these cases with, with really high success. So let, let, let's, try to, let's kind of make it easy. Let's, let's say it's an anterior tube. Let's say it's tooth number eight, it's endodontically treated and it is dark. And the rest of the case is relatively minimal. So I'm gonna use Vita shades because I think it's easier for us to visualize it. Imagine all the preps are A1 conservative. So the porcelain is gonna be less than a millimeter thick. And then you have a C4, which is number eight, full coverage crown, endodontically treated. Or it could be an implant crown, or it could be a metal post or whatever it is. So Josh has a couple options. One is he say, okay, I'm looking at two different substrates and two different thicknesses because that crown is going to be four millimeters thick now or three millimeters thick, right? And the veneer is 0.5. So he says, I'm going to guess. I'm going to go ahead and, and pick either zirconia or Emacs or Lisi. People say, oh, I use zirconia because you can block it out. Emacs has MO and HO ingots. There is no, they are as opaque as any zirconia. Now does Lisi have opaque dent? Yeah. Okay, so you don't, you don't need zirconia to block out a dark prep. I would prefer Emacs or lithium disilicate. And Josh, the last few that we did, you chose Emacs as the coping. Right. And then, so he would say, okay, so let me pick an Emacs or a Lisi that kind of matches the adjacent preps. And then I'll build a bunch of glass on top of it. So I get this case back where I try in the veneers. I love the shade and I try in that single crown and it's off. And the shade's just not right because I have a dark prep. So at that point, there's nothing I can do. I can custom stain it, but that didn't work. It didn't look as good as, as it should have. So I either cement the rest of the case send that one crown back, take a bunch of photos and hope the next time it works. But, but, but I don't have any options. And you know, I tell people I'm a control freak, not in life but when it comes to the anterior of the mouth. And what happened there, I lost control, right? Josh did whatever he could, and he's a master, but it just didn't match. And at that point, I have to send it back. So what we do now is I'll go ahead and take a shade of that prep. We'll talk about that. I take a shade of the adjacent preps. Again, they're all A1. Josh will then, and, and he likes to digitally design it, or he could wax and press it. He'll make it out of Emacs, and he will make literally, it's, it's what we call a correction coping. It's like a thimble. It fits over your prep, but it's the exact same shade as the adjacent props. Not only shade, but also size and shape. Exactly. I'll, take off, I'll take it digitally and have my digital guy mirror 
the prep from nine and flip it over and put it over the the dark prep on eight and mill that out of a block out material like Emacs and and then we're yeah anyway yeah. go ahead. So so you know now literally he's got eight and nine are the exact same prep now. Yeah. It's just that prep happens to be Emacs. Now this is where kind of com option comes in. The last two that we did, he went and had because we use Lisi, he he made a Lisi veneer on top of that new prep that was the exact same thickness as, as a Lisi veneer on the adjacent prep, mm -hmm. right? He actually glued it or bonded it in the lap. So I still get a crown back, but the Lisi is the exact same thickness. That's one way. The second way is for him not to bond it. So I get it back as two pieces. So I go ahead and try in that coping. It's Remember, it's exact same, this is number eight. It's exact same prep as number nine now. Then I have two veneers that are exact same thickness, exact same shade, and I try them in on top of that coping. And if I took good photos and I gave him information and he designed it right, I mean, that's easy. I put two leasy veneers on. So I'll cement the coping first, clean up the excess, and now I've got eight or 10 veneers that are all the same shade. So I think that's the best way to do it, Kent. I hope that answered the question, but we call it a correction coping. And the overlying restoration can either be already bonded on by the lab or you can do it chair side, depends on how much control you want. We've, we've had some really cool ones lately that we've done, Josh. It seems like we kind of go through where we won't see one for six months and it's like three in two weeks. It's like, wait a minute. Um, did that answer that question, Kent? Yeah, I, I believe that they're satisfied. Thank you. Okay. Um, I also want to throw out my email address. A lot of you know it, but it's david at hornbrook.com. David at hornbrook.com. If there's anything we don't answer or don't get to tonight, or you think, I wish I would have asked him this. Um, if it's a question I can't answer, and I think Josh could do a better job, I will, I will forward it on to Josh's email. Josh, I don't know if you want me to... Yeah, you can give it Oh, okay. I know. Or well, I don't want you to have to take breaks when you're doing my cases. <laughs> um, Josh is Josh W. Josh W. At UVDL.com. Josh W. At UVDL.com. And maybe Ken, if you can just post those two in the chat, that would be awesome. Absolutely. So, I'll do it. Um, this is a cool material. And I know Kent, you know, you're kind of looking over all the, the all on X's and this is the material you guys are using for all those, right? Yeah, we, we kind of have pushed the envelope a little bit in that area because initially it wasn't indicated for long span bridges. Uh, even though it has a really high flexural strength, um, I believe it's close to 1200 megapascals, um, depending on how you nest it in the puck. But knock on wood, um, by managing occlusion and, and I think and just following the IFUs, which a lot of labs uh, neglect, um, and then working with some really great doctors, we've we've had a hundred percent success rate in the last two years. I'm not sure that we're having any of these break at this point. So you kind of get your cake and eat it too. Yeah, nice. I mean, we've always struggled with: do you want it to be strong or do you want it to be pretty? Right? <laughs> it's like you got your choice. You can't have both. And I think we've gotten the point where we can have both. Josh, have you seen any of these break? These zirconia and the zircat prime. I'm trying to think not not many um i have had a few i think that have but it was i think because some of the pro, uh, parameters were violated they were too thin uh, stuff like that is is the only reason so there are definite uh things that you have to follow we got to make sure so you might you know know that you might get a phone call saying hey this isn't thick enough we can't go below eight tenths, um, something like that for thickness. And if we do, there's a real high chance that there could be a fracture, so. Yeah, and you know, we can mill them at 0.4 or 0.3. Uh, manufacturers will say it can be 0.5, but I'll, I teach docs based on our experience with the lab, Josh, is never less than a millimeter, never. Especially on second molars, because you, you know, the clinicians that are listening, you've had to adjust and usually the crowns we have to adjust most is second molars or you put a temperate it's maybe a little hypo occlusion tooth erupts us a little bit in that two to three weeks and now that one millimeter is 0.4 that's when we see them break 
Um, so I would say minimum of one millimeter on occlusal thickness on these. And, and you know, I, I've had some break early on because I thought, oh, I can I can prep at 0.5, right? And I had some break. I haven't had a zirconia break in years, years. And I've never had a bridge break, which is which is nice. That's good. So this is, a, again, this, this prime, you can see the connector as we backlit this, the connector is all tetragonal, as, as Kent mentioned, 1200 megapascals, yet we have all this inherent translucencies. So this is a case that we did that's a full mouth rehab, 28 units, premolar forward is Emax, as we decided to use Emax at the time, and the molars are actually HT zirconia. And so even blown up as big as this is, you can't really see much of a difference in, in translucency and color and opacity between the molar and the premolar. And the nice thing about the premolars are super gingival margins, and they're only 0.6 millimeters thick on the axial wall. And so they're very, very conservative, light chamfer margins. And so, you know, we can great, get great aesthetics. A lot of these cases, not the case I showed you earlier that Laura and I did, where it's 20 units of Lisi, but a lot of these cases, Josh, it'll be 20 units of Lisi and eight units of HT zirconia. Um, especially the cases that I don't open vertical and I don't want to reduce any more tooth structure. Yeah. You know, I change vertical, then I've got all kinds of thickness. And I can say, let's make it 28 units of, of Lisi or let's do Emacs on the molars because you want to mill it, right? Yeah. Um, lots of options. And again, the aesthetics we get with this, and I think most of you can relate, this is a different zirconia than what we used to look at zirconia. And these, again, are all just superficially stained, yet they look like teeth and they can either be, you know, I a digital scan and a printed model, or they can be traditional dentistry, analog impression, polyvinyl. All right, so milled will either be zirconia, well, zirconia has to be milled or Emacs. And then wax and press can be either Emacs or Empress, which again, we really can't do anymore, or Lisi Press. So now Josh has cut off the sprue, he's dialed in the occlusion, now he needs to make it look like a tooth. And there's two ways that he does this. One is what we call shaded or stained. And I'm going to say this is molars only. So what he's going to do, he's going to take that wax pattern, whether it be um, milled or traditionally wax. He's going to press it or mill it if it's Emacs or zirconia. And then he's going to superficially stain this. Now, the advantage of this technique is what you see is what you get, right? It's exactly how the digital design when made or the wax. So it's like a gold crown. I mean, the anatomy is perfect. The cusp fossa relationship is perfect. And this is the strongest this restoration will ever be. So we talked about flexural strength. If this is Emacs, that marginal ridge is 400. If he decided to cut that back to add a bunch of cool translucency, that marginal ridge becomes 100. <laughs> if this is zirconia, this would be 550 to 1200. If he cuts it back to give translucency, it's 100. That's shaded or stained. Now, the importance of this is I got to tell Josh what I want, right? I mean, I'm going to typically on my prescription and Josh, you know, it's nice to have you here to keep me honest. You know, if I'm doing a, a posterior, I'll say monolithic zirconia or monolithic Emacs shaded only or stained only. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a very cool material that I know Josh is, is really good at and excited about. We did a little uh, hands on. He did a hands on. All I did was sit there and watch him do it um, on a material called Mio. And again, I would urge you to try a case with Utah Valley if you don't already use them, although I see a bunch of users on here that, that use them, is talk to your ceramics. This is, you know, I would call it a shade, uh, I would call it a stain, like for the Sarah, this looks like a stain, but it's really a liquid ceramic, what they call a frit. And Josh, you can add to this, but unlike a traditional stain, when you stain it, one is you see, what you see is what you get. As you stain it, you know exactly what it's gonna look like. But being a ceramic, even in a very, very thin environment, it looks like it's layered deep into the restoration. There's nothing else, in my opinion, on the market like it. Right. Uh, and some of the stuff that you've done, I thought, why did he cut back and layer this more? <laughs> and there's so much cool stuff in there. And, and you know, as I was telling, there's a few Sarek docs I was talking to. If I did Sarek, which I don't, I would absolutely order Mio stuff, Mio um, to stain my Sarah, because all of a sudden your Sarah's going to look alive instead of superficially stained. Um, and I know you're using this on Emacs. Are you using this on Lisi too? Yeah, it'll go on everything but Empress. 
Uh, okay. So yeah, all of the lithium, all of the zirconia, it's compatible and it's, it's phenomenal. It's my favorite, not only glaze, but stain and effects that you can use. There's some other decent ones out there. Um, GC actually makes their own. Um, that's, that's close, but I think Neo's still, for me, the top dog in the market. Yeah, and they also have Neo Pink. Yeah. So for, you know, we're doing pink up in to replace uh, gingival tissue and you know, whether it be a bridge or an all on X, the pink, all these different crazy shades. I, I mean, there's so much depth in that. And, and there's yeah. molars that I showed you initially that Josh did for me this week that Laura cemented. It was like, holy cow, why'd you cut back and layer those, Josh? I don't want that. You're going to weaken it. It's going to break. Yeah. No. So this doesn't weaken it, but it gives that depth. So, you know, you can get such good looking restoration, get rid of these ugly beasts. Um, and get restorations that look like they've been cut back and layered, but this is all superficially stained and we can get some really cool, cool stuff. All right, so that's shaded and stained. In my office, that would be molars only. The second is cut back and layer. This is actually a technique developed by Lee Culp in the mid nineties. And this would be anterior forward. And I think a premolar is an anterior too. So it'd be second by to second by. And this is where you can see something that's in the two. Now Mia will almost give you this look, yeah. Um, you just don't have, in my opinion, quite as much control, um, but where there's internal lobing and you can see a little amber, I like amber in my incisal ledges where there's just depth that you can see all the way through. There's actually my dental assistant. These are, this is Danielle's Josh. <laughs> These are 28 year old Empress and they're yeah. still on my dental assistant. Again, here's a little bit of gold, a little bit of amber cut back and layered. Now the importance of this is you need to tell the ceramics you want to cut back and layer. So even as much stuff as you and I have done together, Josh, every single case in the interior, it says Lisi press four through 13, cut back and layer, right? Because it's a prescription. Yeah. Again, cut back and layered. And this is how Josh would do it or any other ceramist. They're going to either mill or wax and press to full contour. And this could be zirconia, Emacs or Lisi or any of the other materials. He's then going to cut back the incisal edge. How, how much is he going to cut this back? Depends on what your prescription says. I like a lot of translucency. So typically I try to give him at least a millimeter and a half of room between edge of prep and edge of final restoration. So he'll cut these back a millimeter and a half to two millimeters. Try them back in the original matrix um, because I, I wanted an 11 and a half millimeter central with a millimeter and a half of translucency. He can go back and put it in the matrix and say, yep, I've got a millimeter and a half to give David what he wants. Again, this is how valuable, and we'll talk about incisal edge translucency if we get to it, um, photos are, right? Instead of saying, I want a, a little bit of amber frosted white, I can just send you a photo. And you can say, oh, that's what he means by, by all that noise in, in words that he's putting. And this is where the, the artistry of a master ceramist, of an artistic ceramist comes into play. You know, he'll look at my photo and say, okay, I need a little bit of white or bamboo or coral or blue. Um, again, I like amber in my incisal edges. So again, this isn't just painted on the surface. It's a little deep amber in that incisal edge. You'll try it back in the matrix. Then he'll overlay with a fluorapatite material, a very translucent, do our final bake, polish that up, and then take it to the mouth. And you can see that little hint of amber cut back and layered. Um, this is a tedious but technique. You're not going to pay $69 for this, <laughs> but it's a little jewel in my opinion. It's a little piece of art. And again, looking at Josh and his intensity as he's, he's designing these, like, I get it. I get that, you know, this is like your little baby for the moment, right? <laughs> um, but the problem is that incisal ledge has a strength of 100 megapascals. And, you know, that's typically where we see it break. Not so much in the anterior, if you've managed envelope of function and occlusion, we don't see, I mean, mine are 1999, 21 years old and they're empress. And I do everything I tell my patients not to do, you know, my Doritos bag, you know, my fingernails, all those things I'm not supposed to be doing, protein bars. Um, but if I had a case where the patient, I've had some commercial fishermen that, I mean, that's just asking a lot of that incisal the ledge, where that would all be Mio. So I would tell Josh, take the Lisi or the Emacs or the Zirconium all the way to the edge, paint some pretty blue, a little bit of amber, and let's just keep that at 550 or 800. And that's where communication between the ceramist and, and the doctor will be. All right, let's talk about shades and, and color mapping. Um, 
there's three factors that, that affect the final shade of the restoration. Number one is the ceramic, is the restorative. If it's a PFM, that's the only thing. If it's an opaque zirconia, that's the only thing, the ceramic. But if we have a translucent ceramic, then the prep plays a huge role. And then the cement to a very tiny, we can change value slightly with cement. So what Josh needs, he needs to know what my prep is, right? Because what ceramics do, and Josh, you know, I'd like for you to add to this because I think a lot of dentists don't realize what, what you do. He's going to look at the final shade. So I say, I want to be one. He's going to look at the prep shade. He's going to look at the thickness of the ceramic. Is that the thicker the ceramic, the more it hides the prep. The thinner the ceramic, the higher role the prep plays. And so he's going to measure that. And he's going to go with the ceramic that has the translucency, the opacities, the shade that'll match that formula between prep, final shade, and thickness. And if he doesn't get a prep shade, and I would guess, Josh, that probably one of the most common phone calls you have to make or text is, hey, you didn't send me a prep shade. Would, would, I, would I be right with that? Yeah. Yeah, that often gets forgotten um, is that prep shade. And it is so important to have that. It, it guides so much of what we do. Like you said, picking that correct shade of ingot that we want to use. Ingot is what, you know, that material of Lisi or Emacs is before we press it. Yeah. Um, so we need to know as close as we can what that prep shade looks like because that'll guide and change those options for us. And I look at that, I, I, every time, every single case, I'll have a waxer bring to check off. And when it's ready to go to the press, every single time, even if you've written the shade down and the prep shade color, I'll still look at photos. Yeah. And it's not because I don't trust you, but- <laughs> Are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> it just, I just need to know, because like I said, I'm visual and there's, Oftentimes there's multiple colors in a prep. Um, there's some banding or I just, and I need to see that so that I choose the right ingot uh, color to press these out of. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And remember I, I talked about the three factors. The, the number one factor that takes con total, total control of shade is the opacity of the restoration. So if you need a case back, or this is a typical scenario, and Josh, I don't know if you made this call, where you may call me and say, hey, what's the prep shade, Dave? David, you didn't write it down. And I'd say, really, are you kidding? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. And you say, well, can you have the patient back? Can you take off the temporary? Can you give me a prep shade? And you say, that's not gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> and so at that point, we don't know if the shade is, is gray or if it's bright white. So the only way Josh can, can take control of that is to make an opaque restoration. It's the only way. Right, and then we lose all that beauty of these all ceramic restorations. I get this back and it's like, why do you make this so opaque? Because he wanted to take control. Um, so make sure you give the prep shade. And you know, I created this photo, it's, I think it kind of proves the point. Three different teeth. I wanted a B2. Now, the veneer on the right and the left are the exact same veneer, different prep shades. So if I wanted a B2 and I didn't give the right prep shade, obviously the one on the left would be way too light or vice versa, right? If I wanted a B1 and it was a darker prep and Josh gave me a translucent restoration, especially a thin translucent, it would have been too dark. So, I mean, this, it, one of the first times that we did this, when I got a bridge back and it was Emacs, we, again, this is about 15 years ago when we started doing anterior bridges with Emacs, so it was only about 0.5 to 0.6 millimeter facial reduction, it's thin, right? I get this three in a bridge back and it was replacing a lateral and the ponic was like really yellow and the abutments were not, I mean, they were like three different, two different shades, right? I mean, significant. And I thought, what the heck was he thinking? <laughs> and then when I tried it in the mouth and now I brought, got the preps from underneath on those abutments, everything blended in. And the only way you could have matched that, Josh, would have been if I gave you prep shades, right? Yeah. And it kind of reinforces that. So we use the natural dye material. I know some of you may still have the original stump uh, prep guide from Ivoclar. I would say get the natural dye. These match human teeth. 
um, where I think the other one did not. So you could call Kent and Kent can send, send you one out of these. And, um, but we need to take photos of this. And as Josh said, he wants to see a photo because sometimes like this, it's a little bit off. And he'd say, you know what? It's not quite as gray as that. Let's go a little bit more translucent. Sometimes it doesn't match what we want. And, and we can take maybe a couple. Josh can, can actually mix these together. It's actually a, a flexible putty material, a composite that if it's halfway between ND3 and ND4, he can actually mix them together and make the prep die out of a, a, a conglomeration of the two. Yeah. All right, desired shade, we're gonna end here. Again, we're gonna finish this up later because I wanna make sure that we haven't had many questions, either means that, that we're not transferring a good message or uh, <laughs> answering everyone's questions. All right, desired shade, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, again, I'm visual, mine would never say this, I would send photos, I'd say see photos. If I was matching an existing restoration that maybe something failed and I had done a bunch of stuff around it, I can say a definitive shade. But use photos, you know, how am I gonna transfer all that cool stuff that's going on in that incisal ledge? I mean, there's just no way that I could do that with any justice with words. So we take photos and Josh looks at this and says, I know exactly what he wants. You know, this is a, this is a an easy thing to match. This is um, my favorite shade guide for darker teeth. It's called the Vivident PE guide. It has a lot of translucency because they're actually acrylic versus ceramic. Vivident, V-I-V-O-D-E-N-T PE guide from Iva Clark. Again, use a shade tab. Use multiple shade tabs. Now, a shade like this, it, a guy, it, a photo like this does us no good. Right, Josh looks at that and says, I wonder what shade tab is that? And he calls me and says, what shade tab did you use? And I was like, I don't know. The one I photographed, yeah, I see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing too is, and dentists typically don't do this, is if you're trying a restoration and it doesn't match, um, don't just send it back and say it didn't match. Put it in and take photos around it. Because then Josh looks at that and says, oh yeah, that's what he meant. Yeah, you know, it is too late, right? And this is the reason why. And it's so important because if you don't give me any additional information, the second time is going to be the same as it was the first time. Yeah. Again, I like to use photos um, primarily because I can show transitions, especially when matching adjacent teeth or natural teeth. You know, so I'll actually print a photo on an eight and a half by eleven and and draw in there, and and Josh can see the transitions. Um, again, you can write on the photo, you can write on a piece of paper of what those transitions. But I. You know, it's one thing, Josh, for me to tell you that's 120 and the gingival is a gingival of 130, but that transition zone, you can, you can only replicate that if it's, a, if you see it visually, am I right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, one thing I, I do want to share, because I know Josh and I have had some really, really good results with this. I hope. Maybe it's just coming from my It's for sure. Yeah. So you've all had situations where you try it in a crown, especially if it's a, a single anterior, and you have your operatory light, bright light, and you have your loop light right on that, and it looks amazing. The patient looks in the mirror with all that light and says, amazing. And then you cement it, and you take the light away, and it, it doesn't look quite amazing. It's really, really close. Or you cement it, and the patient comes back, and a week later, just to get some photos, and says, you know what? In certain lights, it just it looks kind of grayish, and that's metamorism. And it's very hard. And, and usually when a restoration doesn't match, it's because of value. Remember the, the three aspects of a shade or color. We've got hue, chroma, and value. And value is where we screwed up. And, and lots of times I'll get a case back and it's just, I transfer the wrong value to Josh. And so I get it back and everything looks good. Shape is amazing. Size of ledge is amazing, but it has kind of a grayish hue. And we, even if you photograph shade guides around it, it's because of the, the intensity of the flash and because of the, the shininess of the flash, it's hard to transfer value. So manufacturers actually created these cross um, polarization guides or, or filters. And I got mine through PhotoMed and it's called Polar Eyes. You go to PhotoMed, Lester Dine probably sells them as well. They can either be used on your ring flash or if you have a double point. So most of my stuff is done with a ring and you can see it, it just, it has four little magnets. It just snaps to the front of the ring. 
And these aren't cheap. They're somewhere in the $495, $500. But you know, unless you drop it and roll over it with your operatory chair, you'll have it forever. Um, so what I do, and I'll show you a case that we just did this week. And Josh, you've seen this because I sent you a photo. Is this is a case where there is, and I want you to look at this because this is an implant on number seven, and that's the temporary. Temporary looks pretty good in all this light, right? So Josh is going to make me a definitive leasy crown on top of this implant abutment. So there's a lot of different shades going on, right? So I take a 2M1, this is the Vita 3D Master. I put that up, then I put the polarization filter and I take it again. Now, notice how that crown, I want you to look at this. That looks pretty good, right? I mean, if we had a bunch of light, we would think that it's plastic, but it looks pretty darn good. But when we see it under a low light, look how gray that is. And so anytime I even try in these restorations, even if I, when I get this backdrop, you just got, I took this Tuesday. Um, when I try it in, I'll try it in and I'll take it with the filter as well. Lots of times value is not right on and I'll take filter again and, and I'll send them to you. So then I'll take the next one, 1M1. And I'll take a photo because I'm trying to match the adjacent to it. Then I'll put it with the polarized. So as I go through these different shades, then every time I pick a shade, if there's like three or four different shades, I'll take one without the filter and one with the filter. So this is a case that we did. Patient came in. This is not, this is one of Josh's best work for here. No. Um, <laughs> Patient came in with this and I said, why don't we just do veneers on the rest of the sponsor? Because I can't afford it and I'm fine. I just want a tooth that looks like the rest of my teeth. Okay, there's a lot of color, right? First thing I do is show Josh the measurements, right? Because the one thing a photo won't do, it won't give him how thick is that banding. So he can look and say, okay, I'm six millimeters up until I hit the first gray. And then I'm two and a half millimeters of that kind of darker brown. Then it goes another millimeter of kind of a, a caramel color. And then it goes to this fourth or fifth shade, right? So he can measure that out. He can actually draw it on the adjacent two. So he'll draw it with pencil on the adjacent two. Then I take my photos, 4M1, because that's some aspect, kind of mid, mid in size ledge of that. Then I'll do it with polarization filter. Then the 4D, which is kind of that caramel color, um, just incisal of the gingival third. I'll take it with the polarization filter. Then I've got the next shade, the 5M, 5M2 with the polarization filter. Notice how these all look a little different. The O1, I want him to see what the incisal edge looks like. And you can see the incisal edge. They all look different. Once I took all that, that shininess off and I eliminated that shine. So this is what we ended getting back. And the amazing thing about this was the first, it, it, I tried it and said, perfect. Now I don't always get that, but you can see he did an amazing job because I gave him that information. Again, you can see it in a facial view. I mean, they're ugly teeth, but I made another ugly tooth to match the rest of the ugly teeth, right? <laughs> um, but it was that transfer and it's really important on implants or single centrals and match nice teeth, especially. Josh, you know, you and I have been working with this for the last probably four or five years. Do you have anything you want to add about that? Go buy one if you don't have one, because it is one of the most valuable tools for you as a dentist to have to transfer information. And the value in a crown as for the color, if you get the value right, you are almost there. If you miss the value, it's a, almost a start over every time. And to transfer that information, the best way to transfer that is with that type of polarization canceling uh, filter on your camera. Yeah. So. And, and like I said earlier, every time I do a, a single anterior tooth, you know, I'll go ahead and try it in. And maybe I try it with different try in gels till I like it. <clears throat> then I take a pic, a photo with the polarized. And it's like, no, <laughs> that's, that's not going to work. Yeah. You know, we got it. But, I send you that photo back and I put the temporary back on, right? Or if it looks great with the polarization filter, then I know it's going to be a slam dunk because we go to cement that. Right. So we're going to go ahead and, and Josh, I would like